Seahawks fans, wherever you may be. Thanks for listening to the show. Join your hosts, Bill Alfstead and Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Hey, hi, Seahawks fans. Welcome back to another episode of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alfstead, sitting down with co-host Keith Myers here to talk Seahawks football. We're going to do a mock draft today, um, our, our third mock draft of the draft season. And uh, this is kind of a stick and pick draft, either sticking at 16 or moving up. So I, I took that um, as, as I could move up in the, in the first round, and I did that option. Uh, Keith stuck at 16 and moved around after that a little bit. Yeah, I moved, um, up, in, I moved up into round two to get a pick there. Yeah, and I also had an alternative draft where I just stuck at all all seven picks, uh, just to kind of see what that looks like as far as you know. I don't know that that's necessarily going to happen, but it's possible we stick at sixteen for sure. And then after that, you never know uh, how things are going to play out. But it should be a fun show talking about a lot of prospects, all that kind of good stuff. So, how you doing, Keith? I'm doing good. This will be a fun show. Is it really yeah. the third one? I was thinking it was only the second mock this we've is done, the but third, the third one because we just did one like two, three shows ago, oh. and we did one like three weeks, four weeks ago or something like that. Okay. This is our this is our um, second to last, because I think we're going to do one more final final before the draft, um, kind of our realistic, this is our final mock draft before the, the real deal uh, draft, but that'll, that'll come up. So just a chance to really talk about a lot of different players, talk about different draft strategies that the Seahawks might approach, uh, and what that would mean, what that would look like for either the rest of the draft or... Uh, you know, if we uh, rob uh, into the future and steal draft picks to move around, uh, what that kind of does too. So <clears throat> I um, am going to present a move up mock uh, from mm-hmm. 16. So I'll go first. So what I was trying to do here is I uh, executed the trade prior to me starting the mock. So I wanted to kind of move up in this draft to see if I could position myself for one of the four quarterbacks that may fall. That didn't happen in my mock. And, um, well, it, it did. So on this one, so I created two separate move up ones. One where I got Dallas Turner at nine. I'm not going to use that mock, but it's possible that we can move up to about nine. Um, and I only used future draft capital. And I know that's going to be like one of those contentious things, but... I felt like we needed to get players this year that were able to to um, to play right away and fill holes, and I didn't want to give up my entire draft to move up in this mock. And so I used future draft capital, and we'll just worry about 2025 when that happens. But I think I gave up like a, a, a first and a third to move up seven spots and pick Dallas Turner, which is one of my favorite players in the draft, so, and I would be happy with that. Like if we if we did that and gave away future draft capital – to get like a premier um, guy that I think is going to be in the league as an edge rusher, you know, for a long time, I I would potentially want to do that. But I was hoping for a quarterback. So I'm going to do my draft where I did get the quarterback. So I moved to 10 um, with New York and gave up um, a second round pick in the future to do that. And then I also moved back one more spot because Minnesota came up and gave me a pick 23 in the draft um, as well to, to move one spot. Seems unrealistic. Uh, but so that's you gave up a second, a second to move all the way up to 10, yes. but then got a first round pick to move back from 10 to 11. Yes. And, and why wouldn't I take that? I just, well, of course I you'd take it that. Because the trade was <laughs> offered to me in the mock simulator and I took the trade. So I traded with Minnesota from 10 to 11 and picked up uh, first round pick 23. So then I ended up with 11 and 23. Um, And I took that deal. So I drafted Michael Penix, um, quarterback, University of Washington with pick number 11. I went ahead, uh, and I think they're disguising this. I I think this is actually possible um, is the the reason that I kept this mock because um, if Seattle moves up, I, it's got to be for a quarterback. I don't see them moving up for Dallas Turner or any other player really at the, in the top, and except for a quarterback. And I think Michael Penix is going to end up going uh, sooner rather than later in this draft. I know that he's valued. You look at all the mocks there or, or big boards, he's valued as a you know first part of the second round or late first. And I think that um, somebody's going to take him in the top 15. 
And um, Seattle's really actually one of the best fits in the draft if you don't consider the Howell trade. Um, but Schneider came out recently and said, you know, that's not going to affect the way that we approach this draft, especially as it, as it uh, comes to quarterbacks. And he's a great fit. I mean, obviously with our um, with Ryan Grubb there, um, he just kind of comes in and is, is ready to go right away if Geno Smith doesn't pick up the offense right away or whatever and the competition you know uh, during during training camp is there and he's got an opportunity um otherwise he's our quarterback of the future starting next year so that's my that's my pick yeah um that's an interesting uh scenario moving up and down it's you give up a lot to move up but then you get a lot coming get back, back down I, so, I got it back i mean I, um, I basically gained seven spots in the draft early in the draft and not really having to give up anything in fact I, I got immediate results back in 2024 to do it as opposed to waiting for 2020 well and usually so. that that future pick that you gave up um is valued as a round lower than if it was current so you gave up a yeah. third round pick I- equivalent in this year's draft to move up and then got a first round pick to move back one spot yeah so which doesn't it's not to me it's not realistic but usually the 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 um, trade scenarios on uh, NFL Mock Draft Simulator, which is what I used for this, um, is fairly realistic on their trades, but it can also favor, you know, quite a bit. It, you know, mm-hmm. as far as uh, point value chart, it can be as many as like two hundred points or so in in favor of one team or the other, depending on on the trade. And this one, I definitely won. So, I had a um, a draft. Uh, and I was, you know, playing around um, with this, where I moved back from sixteen to twenty-five, and Green Bay gave me the rest of their draft. Wow! So <laughs> picks, picks. Basically, they they had no draft picks after that, um, and <laughs> and so it was it was a, a complete um, Herschel Walker trade. Um, wow. That's that's nuts. Yeah. Now um, that would make sense if you had a top three pick. But at 16 to give up your entire draft to move from 25 to 16 seems seems weird. But yeah, you take it if you're playing the mock simulator. You take it because you love all those <laughs> extra picks. Well, yeah. So I um, my draft this time was a stick and pick draft draft at 16, and I moved up in round two, um, and then moved down a lot after that in order to not have like three picks in the draft because that would be make for a boring show. Um, but sticking at 16 happened because uh cooper DeGene, um the cornerback safety out of iowa let's call him defensive back this guy is super athletic smart physical um tackles really well i see him as kind of a come in do everything uh defensive back kind of like what mcdonald had in kyle hamilton in um, baltimore and so he just gives him that that playmaker that you can put anywhere um, in the backfield and and know that you've got a dominant player there and so when he fell that far it made like no sense to draft anyone else wow nice <clears throat> yeah i am um, you know there's a lot of mocks in in the last month or whatever where he's going to be in the in the mid to late 20s available and yeah. i don't think that that's true i think I, that I have he's a hard time got a skill that. set that's very coveted in the nfl especially now where you're talking about uh, multiplicity and being able to do all sorts of different uh, line up against different receivers, different positions, et cetera. And he's a, just a Swiss army knife uh, tool uh, to have in your tool belt, especially with a guy like Mike McDonald, who's very um, uh, moves around, disguises a lot. He's a perfect fit in, in mm-hmm. Seattle. It wouldn't bother me now uh, to me. Yeah. Maybe you want to move back to like 21 ish, 22 and pick him up and, and hopefully pick up another pick but when you've identified your player and he's on your board and he's the guy you just get him and you feel Mm -hmm. good about it and so that's a that's a good pick solid so with my 23rd pick um which i just felt really lucky to have in this mock um byron murphy was sitting there still at 23 and i don't think that that's going to be realistic but there he was on my mock draft and so i picked up byron murphy uh, the defensive tackle from Texas, mm-hmm. and this guy is kind of being labeled as the uh, closest thing to Aaron Donald in this draft, and he's he's a real good player. 
Uh, he's a little short as far as um, his length, but that's the only knock against him, really. Everything else is is super top notch. It's you know he's already got interior pass rushing moves, um, and uh, the skill set that he brings, the twitch, the size, his a- ability to stop the run as well. From that, he's like three hundred eight pounds, six two three oh eight. And um, good good player, especially at that spot in the draft. It's like home run. So I walked away with Penix and Murphy. I can pretty much now walk away from the draft no matter what happens really and know that I've got two guys that are really going to be impact players long term. Yeah. Um, I don't think comparing anyone to Aaron Donald is fair um, to them. Um, but I would say Michael Bennett is going to be a good comp. Um, that Seahawks fans are going to know because this is he's twitchy. That first step is crazy fast. He's going to live in the backfield, um, and he's going to do it at three and five tech. Um, uh, basically, the the three four defensive ends, um, and so yeah, I mean it, he's going to live in the backfield. That's the, I like him. I really do. Uh, that's a that's a fantastic pick, especially at that spot. So that's. Um... Yeah, so now I'm back to my regularly scheduled draft picks, 81, 102. Okay, so now now this is where I start um, start drafting. So I moved up to pick 62, um, and I did that by giving up a third-round pick in 2025. So moving up in round two, I gave up a third-round pick and both of Seattle's fourth-round picks, um, 102 and 118. Um, but I also got 130 back. So by moving down um, um, to the end, very end of, of round four, um, I was able to to make that that work. So um, I, it was a big cost to give up a third round pick next year, but I got a second round pick this year. And so I like that. And I didn't have to give up 81, which I really didn't want to. And I ended up with Junior Colson, linebacker uh, out of Michigan. Um, he is your middle linebacker now he takes over for jordan brooks as kind of the tackling machine do everything guy um i think he's better in coverage but yeah just younger cheaper that's that's the the guy that's the seahawks need they need um a linebacker because i don't think that they have uh the talent there to compete right now and so i mean they've kind of they've they went and signed a couple of guys but Neither of them are long-term solutions, and neither of them are, I mean, they're good coverage guys, but they're not, uh, guys are going to rack up a large number of tackles. So um, getting Colson really filled a need, it, 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 it upgraded a weakness. So I like that pick. Nice. Yeah. Um, I lost my, lost my draft here. So now we're into 81. So, um, yeah, so 81. So I stuck and pick at 81. Um, in my other mock that I really stuck, um, I chose Mason Smith. I didn't choose him in this draft, but I just want to highlight that that's the area where he might be available as well. It's kind of an upside pick, injured in college. Um, and he wasn't on my board in my other mock, but I wanted to, to, to say that. So I went with uh, the best player available on my draft board. I wasn't able to, to draft back. The value there just wasn't coming to me and f- thought I'd take the best player available also I think a future position of need, Jaden Hicks, safety, Washington state. I think he's a good fit in our scheme guy that can play multiple positions, really got great size, six, two, two eleven, but ran a four, five 40. It's going to allow him to move around a little bit. His vertical was 75 percentile, had a great three cone, um, <clears throat> really just kind of knows how to play the position instinctively. Uh, can move around for you on the defense, so he can play up in the box. He can drop back into coverage for you. He's really good against um, uh, running backs and tight ends uh, in coverage. Um, just really good anticipation, and McDonald would love a, a player like Hicks to come in and, and play in his defense, similar to yeah. the role that Gene would have, really kind of can play the nickel um, and can can um, just move around all over for you, play too high uh, as well. No, I like I like that I like the player um, definitely. And so at eighty one, also I went um, a guy that I did not expect to be this low, and that was um, Cooper Beebe, um, guard out of Kansas State. Guy's big, um, 
just an absolute road grader, but with good feet, um, good in pass protection. I think he's the best guard in this draft as like pure guard coming, someone who was a guard in college. Um, there's a couple tackle converts that I think are going to be significantly better. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but as far as just a pure interior lineman um, coming in, I think he's um, the best, uh, the best guard prospect. And that's accounted, you know, Powers Johnson being um, a, a center is using that. So, um, but the guy's just powerful. He comes in, he'll be Seattle starting left guard on day one. You can run behind him. You can trust him in pass protection. Um, I think you get a starter this low uh, in the eighties and a day one starter, you take it. Nice. So at my, um, my pick at one Oh two, I chose mm-hmm. tight end Cade Stover, Ohio state. Um, I think it's a position of need. He's a good, um, multi multi tool at tight end can, can inline block for you can has upside as a pass catcher. Um, Ohio state, good program there. And he's got a good, uh, short shuttle time and agility, um, and, and decent 40 for his size. So I just, it's, it's one of those value picks, um, right at that spot in the draft where, um, he was the best player available on my board plus position of, I think of need for us. And I wanted to choose another player and it was honestly between him and Jeremiah Trotter jr. The linebacker. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, Cade Stover's going to go slightly before Trotter and I'm going to see if Trotter's going to be available later. So <clears throat> I dropped back and traded up. So I want to highlight this trade. So we were at 118 on a pick that I picked up from, uh, Cincinnati. So, uh, I traded, um, actually it was, it was our one eighteen's our native, right? Okay. Yeah, I think so. So we were at one eighteen. I picked, I went up to one fifteen. So I paused my draft. Jeremiah Trotter was still sitting there at one fifteen, And I was like, I gotta, I'm going to go get this guy. And so I moved with Cincinnati, uh, from one fifteen to one or from one eighteen to one fifteen, And um, pick 194 and they gave me pick 192 in return. Um, so I was able to move a little bit around and they gave, I don't know, they gave me a premium to do that. So I went ahead and, and executed that trade and chose Jeremiah Trotter Jr., the linebacker out of Clemson at 115. And basically he's got to come in and chance to, to compete right away for kind of our will linebacker spot. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, I can't remember the, the guy's name right off the top of my head, the guy we picked up in free agency um, to come in and kind of start uh, as a middle linebacker there. Um, and so this guy's kind of be groomed along a little bit. He's six foot 228, but he's the best coverage linebacker in the draft. I think Mike McDonald's kind of moving in that direction as a, as opposed to kind of a plug and play uh, run fit kind of linebacker. He's, he wants his linebackers to be able to uh, to move around um, sideline to sideline speed, drop back into coverage, all that kind of stuff. And so his ability to do that is is top notch. And um, I, I've been kind of eyeing this guy as a middle round possibility for Seattle um, in in the real draft. Um, a guy that can you know, hopefully be available in the, in the fourth round, early fourth round pick um, that we've got there and could come in right away as a rotation piece. But then when our two linebackers uh, move on from their one year deals, we've got a guy that's in in spot there. So. Cool. So my next pick is um, at one thirty because I traded away one eighteen in my um, move up to get junior Colston. Do you have another one before there? I do not. Okay. I'm at 179. So everything else is native. Okay. So I'm ish. <laughs> after yeah. 130, I'm not till 194. So I've got a big gap there. Um, and at 130, I also went uh, tight end, um, as you did a pick previous, um, and went Ben Sennett, um, tight end out of Kansas State. This guy's just got athlete all over him. Um, great vertical. Sh- um, his short shuttle, his three cone is absolutely elite. Um, his broad jump. You know, even his forty is good. So he's he's an athlete. He is a um, not the greatest route runner yet 
in terms of beating man coverage if the person's going to come up and 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 play in his face uh and his blocking is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination uh, which is why it's available here but as far as pure upside goes uh he's probably um got the second high, highest ceiling of the tight ends in the in the draft um behind brock bowers and so that's why i went it went in that direction I'm like you he doesn't have to um come in and be the guy right now because the cx still have uh um their starter you know their main one and so he'll get playing time to improve and whatever but he'll come to be doing that as tight end too and uh i just thought that that would give him a chance to develop and and, and increase those skills and then come out as a legitimate you know uh talent starter in year two nice nice i like it um so i was at 179 which is our native pick and went running back isaac garendo running back out of louisville um i feel like you've taken him in another draft i think so i think you know i think i took him in the first mock that we did um i've been kind of eyeing him as as a prototypical running back size at six foot 221 but he runs a four three three forty and he's got um good short shuttle 10 yard split all that kind of stuff three cone which tells me that he could potentially be very very good in open space and a receiver out of the backfield and i think he just kind of takes on that dj dallas role a little bit he's got some um, kick return and punt return uh, ability and um you know i i know right now we're probably looking okay at our top three starters at the running back room but the team likes to really have four running backs and so I see them maybe prioritizing this in a later round around this area of the draft and yeah, I'm picking up a good value. I think last time we talked, um, or the last mock that we did, you, you picked up Will Shipley. He was mm-hmm. kind of right there um, as well. And I just went with the upside that, that Isaac Grendo has uh, over him a little bit just as far as speed is concerned and low mileage on the tires, really. No, I... Um, I... Yeah, the speed's there. He's a little undersized, if I remember right. Um, Six foot two twenty. Oh, so he's not. He's he's, yeah, he's he's not the guy I was thinking of. Um, two twenty one. Yeah, six foot two twenty one. Yeah, so he's actually good sized guy that can can run over some people. Um, yeah, yeah. Clearly not the 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 person I was thinking of. Because um, doesn't Louisville have a second running back? I don't know. In the I'm draft, sure guys do. like, but he's like one eighty and fast. Um, I don't know. Um, it's early <laughs> in the morning, and I'm still drinking coffee. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I like that. So at 194, which is my next pick, um, I went with a guy that you and I both like, um, and that would be Malik Mustafa, nice. um, safety out of Wake Forest. This guy is raw as you can get, um, but you're not. But I think he's the fastest defensive back in this draft. Um, and just jumped out of the gym at the combine. Just very elite. physical guy too. Yeah, plays physical. Just his vertical, his long jump, his broad jump. You know, his forty time. All these things are elite. And um, can basically, he, is he? Can he play multiple positions though? I thought that was the kind of the rub. He's more of a box safety with that speed though. I think you can teach him down. Yeah, darn near anything. I think you can teach him. And like I said, he's raw, and so he's not a guy you're. He's going to come in and start um in this first year he's going to come in and he's going to use that speed to be um a fantastic special teams player yeah but i love the upside of that kid i really but the upside yeah it's the upside's there um and this is a draft the area of the draft where you're kind of doing that yeah if you can get a guy with a really high upside even if they've got a lower floor go take it go do it so i used my 194 um I think we were originally at 192, right? So both of us kind of traded into 194 because mm-hmm. um, that pick originated from Cincinnati. Um, and I went with Jerry and Jones, the cornerback um, out of Florida State, and a six foot 190, but ran a 43840. Um, his vertical is is uh, 90th percentile. His broad jump is 90th percentile. So he's got a nice explosion there. He's uh, he's multiple, you know, so you can play him on the outside on the boundary. He's also uh, has the versatility to come into 
uh, cover slot positions and so forth. That's exactly what Seattle would be looking for, especially at this left. If you can find a guy that can do all of those things, especially with the upside on the speed, you take a shot, you take a, a guy that you figure can come into your system and learn the techniques, learn from the other guys that are on the roster. And I like the pick um, because I think it, it gives you some positional flexibility, especially, you know, as, as contracts come up and so forth. So a good guy to have in the room on the back end um, to kind of work into a, a, a rotation role in the future. Oh, no, I, I agree. That's, that's a good pick. Um, I like that one. Um, I think I'm up next at um 196 yes you are because mine's uh, our native last pick yeah i've got so i've got four picks still um okay and i <laughs> i got i ended up with four picks because i traded um yeah it was you're right that pick 194 did uh originate from cincinnati because i traded um 179 down to 194 to, and then get 214 um so i ended up getting two picks for one there but i had to move down quite a bit to do it and then i um also traded out of 192 um to get 196 and 217 um nice so, so you picked up three additional picks yeah uh, but they're all they're all like round late round six picks and we're trying so, to fill out a roster so that, that makes some sense in, yeah. in some ways other way i wouldn't be surprised if those same moves happen in this draft but maybe for future draft draft picks in 2025 just because this draft is kind of wishy-washy a little bit at this area of the draft yeah so i mean as far it's, as the, depth and talent yeah once we get down in, into this range uh the talent drops off fairly quickly um and so you're right it's probably not that realistic to do that but i don't like coming out of drafts with five players and so right. i did this to fill out my my roster a little bit um and so with getting it at 196, I got um, Brennan Jackson. He's an edge player out of Washington State. Um, and so he's going to be like an outside linebacker, but he's 264. So he's big for an, uh, an outside linebacker. Um, basically, he is the opposite of um, Daryl Taylor. Um, Daryl Taylor is a guy that if you turn him loose up the field and I don't ask him to do anything else, he can be really productive. Uh but you can't ask him to do anything else. And um, Jackson's a guy who's really good against the run, sets the edge um, extremely well, very smart in the way he plays that, makes a lot of plays, um, you know, a lot of tackles and stuff for a guy who plays that position, uh, but is really unrefined as a pass rusher and needs a lot of work in that regard. So, um, yeah, basically, you know, if you have to, you can pair him with, um daryl taylor like if somebody gets hurt um and you need to fix one of the sides right because you've got uh let's say you chin also gets hurt again and you you know daryl taylor is going to be on that side well now you've got someone that can you can pair with them and between the two of them you have a good player um and at 196 i thought getting a guy that what, can, can let me do ask the you this stuff, what skill like set it. is mike mcdonald going to value more honestly i don't know um he likes guys that can do everything um, that's what worries me about Daryl Taylor is he's going to see Daryl Taylor flash as a pass rusher, but when he comes to stopping the run or dropping back into coverage, he's just not going to be able to do it. Yeah, um, he's a situational he's guy. You know, if they can magically coach him up um, to limit his liabilities, um, great. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, a guy like Brendan Jackson comes in and, and literally plays well enough at rushing the passer and shows some ability and some flash, but is is stout against the run and so forth. I could see Daryl Taylor being cut in favor of a guy that can actually um, hold the edge and mm -hmm. phys physically um, overmatch Taylor. I don't know if he'll get cut. The teams are going to see that nine and a half sacks that he he got in 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 what was it nine games or eight games um, a couple of years ago and think okay this guy's just not being used well in Seattle and especially given the old coaching staff and it's pretty clear that the league is agreeing that he wasn't used well um is and, he a player that, player that you think that, that you could flip for like a fifth or sixth round pick i think in, you, yeah. in, in the middle of the draft just kind of like hey we picked up our pass rusher that's going to kind of replace him kind of an edge setting defensive end maybe yeah um and and because we've already got you know a pretty good stable of pass rushers 
Um, I think you can so, flip him for for something like, or even if you you don't in the draft because you still want to see what he's like got. Jared Verse, for example, um, oh, in, in our ooh. stick and pick at sixteen, if he fell to us or whatever, that would be the same position that Daryl Taylor plays. But essentially. it's also the. I mean, so we, now you've got um, Nuasu, Mafe, and Verse that all play the same position and all deserve starting snaps. Yeah, and the kid we picked up from um, Michigan. Yeah. Morris. Mm-hmm. Who so, looked really good last year until... That's what I'm saying, is if they drafted... If they made him the pick at 16, you could kind of flip Taylor uh, yeah. after that selection for you know something at the back end of the draft just to get something and yeah. um, know that you were going to move, move off of him anyway. So Yeah, I mean, I, I, more realistic, I don't think they're taking verse at 16, so I think they're... Um, more likely going to get someone in the fifth or sixth round and then they'll bring everybody into camp. But that doesn't mean that halfway through camp, um, somebody is looking for a pass rusher and you, you move them for like a fifth round pick in next year's draft during training camp. Right, so you've got a few more picks um, prior to the 235. So go ahead. Um, so my next one is Brandon Coleman. Um, he's an interior offensive lineman from, um, TCU and the guy is athletically just, I, I'm surprised that he wasn't better in college when, when he, you look at his testing, cause his testing is outstanding. Um, but he can, uh, move, um, he can pull him. You can, you can get him, uh, into space. He can get to the second level. Cause this guy's just got, um, He's just got that athleticism. Um, he needs to learn to keep his balance back a little more. He gets out um, over his toes a little too far. Um, and, you know, I've seen some things saying that he doesn't have the mean streak that you need. And I think, um, I don't know, you, you, that is a, it's a thing. And so you'll worry about it. I actually was able to look at him and see, this is a guy that I'd move to center um, instead of at guard. Um, I think with his athleticism, mm -hmm. you can pull him in the running game. You can use him to combo block and then get to the second level and block a linebacker, that type of thing. Um, and as a center, he also seems to uh, be really smart about the way he hands off um, stunts and that kind of thing. So I think that would be a guy that, that to me looks like he would um, exceed uh, as a center. And so... Uh, having him come in, learn the position behind Olobatimi, um, obviously not start right away because Olobatimi would, but push Olobatimi for playing time as you go forward. Interesting. Nice. Um, do you have one more before I do? I have 217 and 235. Okay, so go ahead. Why don't you just finish up? Okay, so um, 217, the draft really was like, wow, there's not a lot here that's worth picking. Um, I went ahead and picked up uh, Jordan Travis, quarterback out of Florida State. Um, this was more of a, you know, um, Schneider saying he wants to get a quarterback in, um, you know, in, in every draft. And so who, if you're going to pick one down here at the very bottom of the draft, who is worth taking a look at? Um, and I don't know. Um, you're never it's very rare you're going to find uh, a, any kind of guy that's going to be a um, an elite player down here. But he, what he does is he's got some athleticism. He averaged more than five yards per carry um, as a runner. Um, he plays with uh, a lot of poise, doesn't seem to get rattled. Um, and yeah, he just got, he needs to learn to read a field and, and, um, make quicker decisions when he in throwing it, and he doesn't have, um, he doesn't have that cannon for an arm. So he he needs to learn to throw with more anticipation. Um, and yeah, I mean, people have compared him to guys like um, Colt McCoy or Case Keenum, right? They're not, um, not guys that look like they're going to be high end caliber players, but still had long careers as backups and, and mm -hmm. um, flirted with start, starting here and there. Um, he has a chance to, you know, improve and be more um, Kirk Cousins-ish, where a starter in the league, but maybe not an elite starter. 
And, you know, that's the kind of level that you could get to with him, I think. What's your philosophy? What's your general philosophy? I mean, I know you selected him in this mock, but what's your general philosophy on um, the Seahawks selecting a quarterback in the late rounds this this season, knowing we've got Howell as as a backup and developmental prospect on the roster, but they always want to carry a third corner quarterback what kind of value do you put on that do you wait until priority free agency or do you pick the guy up that you really are interested in in the seventh round because i think you pick the guy that much more upside because that's what the seventh round is is it's guys that you like that you want you really don't want to lose in priority free agency time um you know right after the draft because the other teams could sign them too so it's really kind of first one to them tends to get the get the player because it's it's not. It's more of a. Can we get him fast enough? And so, okay, spend a seventh round pick on him. Then he's yours. You guaranteed, and you know you worry about someone else. And so that's kind of my my philosophy is if there's a guy that you really want, um, that's in that late seventh um, priority free agents around, just draft him. Now on on the on the quarterback situation, do you carry a third quarterback all year on your roster? Or is this guy a guy that? can move to the practice squad where nobody else would pick him up because they would have to carry him on the, on the, yeah. Um, see, I think, I think I would, well. I would try and I would push him through. Um, and, and I mean, it kind of also kind of depends on what happens during camp, right? If he comes in and looks like, Hey, maybe he's, um, going to be More better than, than we thought, then, yeah. okay, maybe he doesn't get through to the practice squad. So you got to hold him on the roster. Um, but, more likely he's going to get through to the practice squad. You're going to have him there as your third quarterback. And, um, you know, you've got a guy that you can develop right next to your other developmental quarterback. <laughs> right. All right, so, Keith, what do you do at 235? At 235, I am finally at the end of this. Um, I went with an edge player, uh, Miles Cole out of Texas Tech, um, a guy that's as raw as you will get. Um, he's got physical attributes, um, and that's about it, but he, his physical attributes give him a higher upside than, um, you know, a lot of the other guys being taken in this part of the draft. And that was really the only thing I had on taking yeah. him. It's, just, right. it's a huge drop off on the quality of play. <laughs> at the start I really of the draft. like the guy, and the guy that I'm I'm choosing is consistently there for me in mocks. I think he's going to end up going. I'm hearing a little bit of buzz about this kid, and he, uh, I think he ends up going a little bit sooner in the draft, maybe at the top end of the seventh round or the back end of the sixth round, kind of an area. But Jalex Hunt is the edge out of Houston Baptist, and the reason that he's way down in the draft is um, he went to Houston Baptist. Um, and so he's, you know, lower level prospect, um, in that respect, but he's got, he's very toolsy. He's six four two fifty two and a four six four forty. Check out these agility things though. He went to the senior ball. Jim Nagy's got a really nice, a lot of nice things to say about him. He's got an 83 inch wingspan, Keith, uh, 10 yard split is one sixty, which is in the 80th percentile, but his vertical is well, 38 inches at 91%. He's got a broad jump of 128, which is uh, nearly 100 percentile for his size and weight. And he's just got a lot of physical ability, um, excellent frame, long arms, um, explosive uh, off the edge. Um, he's He used to be a, a safety. Uh, so this is a kid that's got experience uh, in coverage. Um, so that's an upside that you don't normally get in this level of the draft. And then the character, the the leadership. So he was a, a locker room guy, a team captain guy. Um, with that sort of explosion and so forth, he's going to be a good special teams player, you know, right off the bat. And so he just kind of fills an area of need. You know, we're pretty good at edge rusher, but you can never have enough. You always kind of want to draft a guy. And this is my guy. Now, as far as my entire draft is concerned, I'm a, I'm I'm disappointed in my own draft, but I went ahead and put it out here anyway, just because I thought it was interesting at the top, but I didn't end up drafting any offensive linemen, which is completely against what I normally do, but I kind of went best player available and position of needs kind of, um, in my draft. Now I probably could have picked up a, a, a offensive lineman with Isaac, uh, Isaac, uh, Garendo's spot at 179, but during my, 
my window of prospects available on the big board uh, with that pick. I just didn't have any offensive linemen that had better value than he did. And so I went with, with that pick at the time thinking maybe I would get something at 194. When I was at 194, Jerry and, Jerry and Jones was there, which I just valued more than some of the other linemen that were that were there that I didn't even think could make the roster, to be completely honest. Mm-hmm. And so I went with the guy that I thought could. Um, and that's how my draft ended up the way it did. Yeah, see, I'm looking at mine um, now that you say that, and I'm like, I got my offensive lineman. I got Cooper BB and I got Brandon Coleman. So I felt good about that. But you know what I don't have anywhere on my entire draft is a defensive lineman, which is not a good sign. I got two outside linebackers, an inside linebacker, a safety, and a do it all defensive back. So I drafted heavy on defense, but didn't get the most valuable spots, which are the big guys up front. Um, I really do like the drafts that I create. And maybe you're the same way. I really like the drafts that I create where I double up on both interior offensive line and defensive line. Mm -hmm. um, Because I think those represent the best value. Um, These other players, these other picks, like the Cade Stover picks, the Jaden Hicks, the Jeremiah Trotter linebacker, et cetera. They're fine picks, but are they really going to make a difference on your team on your roster? Maybe, I mean, but, you know, where we've really been exposed, uh, especially like against um, San Francisco 49ers, for example, they just overmatch us on both Mm -hmm. interior and uh, defensive and offensive lines. And until we can get competitive in those areas, we're not going to be able to take this division back. Um, So I would imagine this draft really honestly is – is I think they end up picking a defensive um, lineman first. You know, there's a, there's a few guys out there like, you know, I don't know if Dallas Turner is going to end up being there. I'd love that, obviously. But Jared Verse, they've had him in for a 30 visit. Uh, a guy like uh, Latu from UCLA, if he checks out medically, God, would be an are, interesting those pick. Are, those are edge players. Those are outside linebackers. I know, but those like Byron Murphy, I linemen. know, but I'm just talking investing into the line in general. Um, and a guy like uh, Newton, uh, defensive lineman from Illinois, is, is an option. Um, top 25 player in this draft. Again, I mentioned Byron Murphy. Um, and then on the other side, or, or Robinson from Penn State, a uh, guy like Barton, um, a guy like uh, Fatanu uh, from University of Washington. I think all those guys are in play, um, either on offense or defense. And I think... That kind of continues through the draft. I mean, if you were uh, John Schneider, as you did, picked up three or four extra picks in this draft, I think we'd probably end up with three or four uh, interior um, players, Mm -hmm. both on offense and defense out of this draft. Yeah, I agree. I think that you're going to see linemen. I think you saw that in the way that they they went into um, free agency and, you know, just rebuilding this roster, uh, they got rid of the overpriced um, safeties and didn't put a priority on keeping their um, middle linebackers that were both expensive. Um, instead, their main priority was the defensive linemen. Um, and okay, then they filled out the roster with cheaper uh, options, but they they went after the linemen first. Um, they weren't able to do that on the offensive side of the ball, um, but I think we're going to see that in the draft. I think we're going to see them go, um, you know, go young on the offensive line, but talented. Um, the Fontenot, the guy from uh, the tackle from Washington, that can uh, that some teams view as a as a guard and um, can play both. I could see him absolutely coming to Seattle in you know at pick twenty one or you know somewhere in there if they trade down. Um, giving them an elite left ta- or left guard and a guy that can slide out to tackle if um, Lucas's knee isn't healthy or if something happens to cross, like you've got a guy that you can, you know, that can go out slide out and play that spot um, and do it at a high level too. So th- that's the kind of thing that I, I could absolutely see this team doing um, in order to get better where they need to. Like you can't, you're not going to win if you're awful on the, at the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. 
So last time that we talked, I don't believe they had officially signed Lake and Tomlinson. I think that he he was signed essentially mm-hmm. later in the day after we'd already done our um, our show. Tell me about the your feeling about Lake and Tomlinson to fill the left guard spot on this roster. And, um, you know, he had it signed a $4 million contract, including incentives up to $4 million. So his base is, is going to be low enough where if he doesn't get that starting spot. It's not, not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to me about that a little bit and how that might change the philosophy in the draft. To me, it doesn't change anything. Um, because he's a guy that his de- best days are behind him. Um, he did play. He did play uh, all seventeen games. Started all seventeen games last year. Yeah. So he. I'm not saying that he's. Um, I mean, he's been uh, a guy that can. That that's been um, durable. But his best days are behind him. He, when he was at he's his best, I think. <clears throat> when he was at his best, he was kind of a a phone booth type guard that can take whoever's in front of him and drive them backwards. Um, just an absolute mauler, but never great laterally um, and and in space. It's kind of not who he was. Um, but what he is is cheap um, and very experienced and someone that the coaches can trust to uh, communicate well with the younger players and be good in the locker room, good in the film room with the younger players. Um and you know, kind of do his job as to the best of his ability without making a ton of mistakes, like mental mistakes. I just don't think that he's got a lot left in the tank physically. Um, you know, to go back and because he was a Pro Bowler at one point, and I just yeah, um, like if he if he had that kind of ability still, he would be making a lot more money than the um, just over league minimum that he's he's set to make this year um, if he doesn't hit any of the incentives. But he hasn't been that guy in a couple of years, and and so we'll see. Yeah, he's um, like a sixty, you know, pro football focused rates, you know, whatever. Uh, he's like a, a guy that's in the in the sixty range as far as being a pass blocker and a run blocker. He does both, you know, fairly yeah, so he's, equally well. He's, he's a good mentor above guy. Average. That, yeah, he's a good mentor guy. To me, it's a it's slightly more than a draft hedge. It's a guy that could come in and mm-hmm. start for you if you miss in the draft. Um, which is great. Or if you, you know, choose a developmental project like Mahogany, for, for example, the kid from Boston College, um, wh- who I really like in this draft is just a physical kind of mauler mentality. You, you mentioned a guy that um, has that mean streak. That's the guy that had the mean streak. I get a guy like that in the middle rounds mm-hmm. to come in and he's ready to go next year. Um, yeah, that, and that would be that would be perfect. See, but that's what this pick, that's what this, this signing is, is it's a, it's a one-year guy um to fill in fill a need um at a low cost that gives you one year to develop someone and it really took the pressure off uh schneider and to yes. get a starter right yes. away so he doesn't he can take a guy like mahogany that's a really Does. high upside um high high ceiling guy that just needs more development time so you just mentioned the idea of taking the pressure off does that in any way tell you a direction that John Schneider is going to go with that first pick. No, like there's been a lot of conversation <laughs> about picking an offensive lineman and interior offensive lineman. You know, I know John mm-hmm. Schneider's, you know, talked about overdrafting or overpaying guards recently, but I don't think that that means anything really. It's was that uh, real or was that him trying to tell people exactly. that he's right. not going to, he's not going to value guards. So we, so that maybe his top player can drop to him. Um, Potentially. And it's so, lying season. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know. Like there's been a lot of talk about Seattle drafting a guard, and I get it because we've had this gaping hole. Now that we don't have the gaping hole, at least the hole isn't as big. Mm-hmm. Does that does that did they make the move knowing that they really wanted to draft a defensive guy first, is what I'm asking. Maybe. I think it's it is a it's it's about flexibility. I don't I think that I don't think they were taking a guard at sixteen. If they were going to take a player, you know, sixteen to twenty-one, it would be a tackle slash guard like Fontenot, um, yes, someone that they that 
in a year can be your starting right tackle if you need him to be, um, or actually could be right now, but be an elite starting right tackle if you need him to do, but also could be an elite left guard if you want him to be. Um, that, you know, I think they wanted to make it so they didn't have to go that route, that they could go and take a guy like Cooper DeGene or a Jared Verse or, um, you know, someone... Any other position, right. Yeah, someone um, with more positional value um, or Michael Penix, uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. and at that spot, and then um, worry about getting their their guard later, um, and not and if they're their developmental prospect that's going to take a year, guess what? You can give them a year. Fascinating. So, okay. So, a um, couple of the other uh, shows that we've got coming up as we're talking about, uh, we've talked about strategy just right now. I think we're going to devote an entire show to strategy uh, mm-hmm. regarding the draft, you know, taking a look at our own roster, our free agency, um, and the different ways that John Schneider's kind of approached the draft in the past, how that kind of informs what he might do uh, this time. Uh, different coaching staff now, different pr- priorities and needs. I've been reading a book about, um, oh gosh, who was the coach from for Miami and, and Dallas? Um, won Super Bowl with Dallas. Jimmy um, uh, Jones. Which one call it? No, not no. Jones. Johnson. Jimmy Johnson. So I've been reading yep. a Jimmy Johnson a biography about how he built uh, teams both at Miami and, and Dallas and so forth. And talks about coming in as a new coach and uh, a new staff, you know, especially after Tom Landry was there and all that kind of stuff, Barry Schweitzer. But um, come in and just make the, the roster your own. Get the kind of players that you need to, to create an identity that is yours. And this is not like a one-year fix-it uh, deal for Mike McDonald. I think that we have to look at this as kind of a two- or three-year Thing. Even though our roster is okay, we've got kind of a 50 or a 500 team, uh, and you think he's going to be able to be a couple of draft picks away from turning this defense completely around from ranking uh, 32 to you know no, to one. It's not going to happen. You know, he's, there's going to be some frustration. He's going to have players that he didn't select that he had no um, input on uh, that he's going to have to have rostered on his team this year that won't be with us next year because they're just not the kind of players that he wants to have around. So there's going to be some churn. And um, I just, I I think that there's a big conversation to be had on strategy. Like how do they really build this? Not just this year. This is, it's very myopic. It's easy to kind of get sucked into the idea that you can somehow fix this whole thing in, in one season. We're not that great of a roster. Let's be honest. You take a look at San Francisco and the Rams coming up and even what Arizona is doing. It's like our roster's, fine but it's not special we don't have a lot of blue chip players we don't have a lot of players that are really difference makers on this roster so there's there's a little bit of time to build this yeah. thing. that's why i think like sticking at 16 or moving up just slightly to get a really good player a player that's going to make a difference on your roster might be more important to them than we think it is this year as opposed to kind of dropping back to 22 and then to 26 and picking up three or four draft picks in this draft that's not so great after round four might not be the philosophy that they've they want to employ so i kind of want to have a conversation about that and just kind of bounce it back and forth and see what you think and we can do that yeah. in a different show let's do that okay and then we'll do our our final mock um you know coming up and then we'll have a draft preview show as well so um good show lots to talk about as far as uh all the prospects it was it was it's always fun to do that so you can find Keith at Myers NFL on Twitter. You can find me at NW Seahawk. The show is Seahawks Playbook Podcast. Find us on your favorite podcast platform and our YouTube channel. So until next time, go Hawks. Go Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Bill is at NW Seahawk. Keith is at Myers NFL. And the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.